At 6 a.m., Earth Eastern Time, which we were still carrying, Snap Dean and I were alone in his instrument room, perched in the network over the planetara's deck. The bulge of the dome enclosed us, it rounded like a great observatory window some twenty feet above the ceiling of this little metal cubbyhole. The plain terra was still in Earth's shadow. The firmament black, interstellar space with its blazing white, red and yellow stars lay spread around us. The moon, with nearly all its disk illumined, hung, a great silver ball, over our bow quarter. Behind it, to one side, Mars floated like the red tip of a smoldering cigar in the blackness. The earth, behind our stern, was dimly, redly visible, a giant sphere, etched with the configurations of its oceans and continents. Upon one limb a touch of sunlight hung on the mountain tops with a crescent red-yellow sheen. And then we plunged from the cone shadow. The sun with the leaping corona, burst through the blackness behind us. The earth lighted into a huge, thin crescent with hooked cusps. To Snap and me, the glories of the heavens were too familiar to be remarked. And upon this voyage particularly we were in no mood to consider them. I had been in the radio room several hours. When the plane terror started, and my few routine duties were over, I could think of nothing save Halsey's and Carter's admonition, be on your guard. And particularly, watch George Prince. I had not seen George Prince. But I had seen his sister, whom Carter and Halsey had not bothered to mention. My heart was still pounding with the memory. Dr. Frank evidently was having little trouble with pressure-sick passengers. The Planetara's equalizers were fairly efficient. Prowling through the silent metal lounges and passages, I went to the door of O-22. It was on the deck level, in a tiny transverse passage just off the main lounging room. Its name grid glowed with the letters, Anita Prince. I stood in my short white trousers and white silk shirt, like a cabin steward staring. Anita Prince. I had never heard the name until this night. But there was magic music in it now, as I murmured it. She was here, doubtless asleep, behind this small metal door. It seemed as though that little oval grid were the gateway to a fairyland of my dreams. I turned away. Thought of the Grantline Moon Expedition stabbed at me. George Prince, Anita's brother, he whom I had been warned to watch. This renegade associate of dubious Martians, plotting God knows what. I saw, upon the adjoining door, a twenty, George Prince. I listened. In the humming stillness of the ship's interior there was no sound from these cabins. A twenty was without windows, I knew. But Anita's room had a window and a door which gave upon the deck. I went through the lounge, out its arch and walked the deck length. The deck door and window of a 22 were closed in dark. The deck was dim with white starlight from the side ports. Chairs were here but they were all empty. From the bow windows of the arching dome a flood of moonlight threw long, slanting shadows down the deck. At the corner where the superstructure ended, I thought I saw a figure lurking as though watching me. I went that way, but it vanished. I turned the corner, went the width of the ship to the other side. There was no one in sight save the observer on his spider bridge, high in the bow network, and the second officer, on duty on the turret balcony almost directly over me. As I stood and listened, I suddenly heard footsteps. From the direction of the bow a figure came. Purser Johnson. He greeted me. Cooling off, Greg? Yes, I said. He passed me and went into the smoking room door nearby. I stood a moment at one of the deck windows, gazing at the stars, and for no reason at all I realized I was tense. Johnson was a great one for his regular sleep, it was wholly unlike him to be roaming about the ship at such an hour. Had he been watching me? I told myself it was nonsense. I was suspicious of everyone, everything, this voyage. 
I heard another step. Captain Carter appeared from his chart room which stood in the center of the narrowing open deck space near the bow. I joined him at once. Who was that? he half whispered. Johnson. Oh, yes. He fumbled in his uniform, his gaze swept the moonlit deck. Greg, take this. He handed me a small metal box. I stuffed it at once into my shirt. An insulator, he added swiftly. Snap is in his office. Take it to him, Greg. Stay with him, you'll have a measure of security, and you can help him to make the photographs. He was barely whispering. I won't be with you, no use making it look as though we were doing anything unusual. If your graphs show anything, or if Snap picks up any message, bring it to me. He added aloud, well, it will be cool enough presently, Greg. He sauntered away toward his chart room. By heavens, what a relief! Snap murmured as the current went on. We had wired his cubby with the insulator, within its barrage we could at least talk with a degree of freedom. You've seen George Prince, Greg? No. He's assigned A-20. But I saw his sister. Snap, no one ever mentioned. Snap had heard of her, but he hadn't known that she was listed for this voyage. A real beauty, so I've heard. A cursed shame for a decent girl to have a brother like that. I could agree with him there. It was now 6 a.m. Snap had been busy all night with routine Cosmos radios from the Earth, following our departure. He had a pile of them beside him. Nothing queer looking? I suggested. No. Not a thing. We were at this time no more than 65,000 miles from the moon's surface. The plane Terra presently would swing upon her direct course for Mars. There was nothing which could cause passenger comment in this close passing of the moon, normally we used the satellite's attraction to give us additional starting speed. It was now or never that a message would come from Grantline. He was supposed to be upon the earthward side of the moon. While Snap had rushed through with his routine, I searched the moon's surface with our glass. But there was nothing. Copernicus and Kepler lay in full sunlight. The heights of the lunar mountains, the depths of the bearing, empty seas were etched black and white, clear and clean. Grim, forbidding desolation, this unchanging moon. In romance, moonlight may shimmer and sparkle to light a lover's smile but the reality of the moon is cold and bleak. There was nothing to show my prying eyes where the intrepid Grantline might be. Nothing at all, Snap. And Snap's instruments, attuned for an hour now to pick up the faintest signal, were motionless. If he has concentrated any appreciable amount of ore, said Snap, we should get an impulse from its rays but our receiving shield was dark, untouched. Our mirror grid gave the magnified images, the spectro, with its wavelength selection, pictured the mountain levels and slowly descended into the deepest seas. There was nothing. Yet in those moon caverns, a million million recesses amid the crags of that tumbled, barren surface, the pinpoint of movement which might have been Grantline's expedition could so easily be hiding. Could he have the ore insulated, fearing its rays would betray its presence to hostile watchers? Or might disaster have come to him? He might not be on this hemisphere of the moon at all. My imagination, sharpened by fancy of a lurking menace which seemed everywhere about the plain terra this voyage, ran rife with fears for Johnny Gratline. He had promised to communicate this voyage. It was now, or perhaps never. 6.30 came and passed. We were well beyond the Earth's shadow now. The firmament blazed with its vivid glories, 
The sun behind us was a ball of yellow-red leaping flames. The earth hung, a huge, dull red half-sphere. We were within 40,000 miles of the moon. A giant white ball, all of its disk visible to the naked eye. It poised over the bow, and presently, as the plane Terra swung upon its course for Mars, it shifted sidewise. The light of it glared white and dazzling in our windows. Snap, with his habitual red celluloid eyeshade shoved high on his forehead, worked over our instruments. Greg. The receiving shield was glowing a trifle. Rays were bombarding it. It glowed, gleamed phosphorescent, and the audible recorder began sounding its tiny tinkling murmurs. Gamma rays. Snap sprang to the dials. The direction and strength were soon obvious. A richly radioactive ore body was concentrated upon this hemisphere of the moon. It was unmistakable. He's got it, Greg. He's. The tiny grids began quivering. Snap exclaimed triumphantly, here he comes. By God, the message at last. Snap decoded it. Success. Stop for or on your return voyage. We'll give you our location later. Success beyond wildest hopes. Snap murmured, that's all. He's got the ore. We were sitting in darkness, and abruptly I became aware that across our open window, where the insulation barrage was flung, the air was faintly hissing. An interference there. I saw a tiny swirl of purple sparks. Someone, some hostile ray from the deck beneath us, or from the spider bridge that led to our little room, someone out there was trying to pry in. Snap impulsively reached for the absorbers to let in the outside light. But I checked him. Wait. I cut off our barrage, opened our door and stepped to the narrow metal bridge. You stay there, Snap. I whispered. Then I added aloud, well, Snap, I'm going to bed. Glad you've cleaned up that batch of work. I banged the door upon him. The lacework of metal bridges seemed empty. I gazed up to the dome, and forward and aft. Twenty feet beneath me was the metal roof of the cabin superstructure. Below it, both sides of the deck showed. All patched with moonlight. No one visible down there. I descended a ladder. The deck was empty. But in the silence something was moving. Footsteps moving away from me down the deck. I followed, and suddenly I was running. Chasing something I could hear, but could not see. It turned into the smoking room. I burst in. And a real sound smothered the phantom. Johnson the purser was sitting here alone in the dimness. He was smoking. I noticed that his cigar held a long frail ash. It could not have been him I was chasing. He was sitting there quite calmly. A thick-necked, heavy fellow, easily out of breath. But he was breathing calmly now. He sat up in amazement at my wild-eyed appearance and the ash jared from his cigar. Greg! What in the devil? I tried to grin. I'm on my way to bed, worked all night helping Snap. I went past him, out the door into the main corridor. It was the only way the invisible prowler could have gone. But I was too late now, I could hear nothing. I dashed forward into the main lounge. It was empty, dim, and silent, a silence broken presently by a faint click, a stateroom door hastily closing. I swung and found myself in a tiny transverse passage. The twin doors of A20 and A22 were before me. The invisible eavesdropper had gone into one of these rooms. I listened at each of the panels, but there was only silence within. 
The interior of the ship was suddenly singing with the steward's siren, the call to awaken the passengers. It startled me. I moved swiftly away. But as the siren shut off, in the silence I heard a soft, musical voice. Wake up, Anita, I think that's the breakfast call. And her answer, all right, George.